This PowerPoint presentation is entitled Differentiating Between a One-Sample T-Test and a One-Sample Z-Test. The objectives of this PowerPoint presentation are that the student will be able to differentiate between a One-Sample Z-Test and a One-Sample T-Test and describe when to use each test. One-Sample Z-Tests and One-Sample T-Tests are used to answer the same research question. Is the population mean greater than, less than, or different from some numeric value? For both the one sample and Z and one sample T tests, we have a single sample of subjects and we want to make an inference to a single population. Thus, the terms one sample for both tests. One sample T tests, like one sample T tests, Test the null hypothesis H0 mu equals some value versus H0 mu is not equal to that value for a two-sided or two-tailed test. HA mu is less than some number for a left-tailed test or HA mu is greater than some number for a right-tailed test. That is, both one sample Z tests and T tests have the similar notation for the null and alternative hypothesis. Both tests can be used with the not equal sign in the alternative hypothesis, making them a two-sided or two-tailed test, with the less than sign in the alternative hypothesis, making it a left-tailed test, or with the greater than sign in the alternative hypothesis, making it a right-tailed test. For one-sample Z tests, the parameter mu, the population mean, is unknown, but the parameter sigma the population standard deviation is known. However, this is an unrealistic situation. Normally, when we want to make an inference about a population mean, we go out and collect a sample of data. We compute the sample mean x bar from that sample data and we compute the sample standard deviation from that sample data. The Z-test, however, assumes that we know the population parameter sigma from the population data. Again, this is an unrealistic situation in practice. Many elementary statistics textbooks say to use the one-sample Z-test when you have a large sample size, for instance, n is greater than 30. However, certain computer packages, such as SPSS, do not compute one-sample Z-tests. So in practice, if you needed to answer the question mu equals 100 versus mu is not equal to 100, the only test that you can run in many computer packages is a one-sample t-test. For the one-sample t-test, neither the parameter mu or sigma is known. That is, mu is estimated by x-bar and sigma is estimated by s. This is a much more realistic situation than that called for in the one-sample z-test. Therefore, the one-sample t-test becomes the default test to use for testing this hypothesis testing situation. The one-sample t-test should be used in practice. When the sigma is replaced by s in the test statistic formula, the critical values must come from the t-table rather than the z-table. Other than the critical values, the one-sample z-test is identical to the one-sample t-test. For instance, to test the hypothesis H0 mu equals 100. With the one-sample z-test, the formula for the test statistic is z equals x bar minus mu naught, the value of 100 in this case, divided by sigma over the square root of n. To carry out the test statistic with the one-sample t-test, the formula is t equals x bar minus mu naught divided by s over the square root of n. Numerically, we have the sample standard deviation s replacing sigma in the t-test formula. Other than that, the computation of the t-test is exactly the same as the computation of the z-test. The difference comes in the table where the critical values are found. For the one-sample t-test, the critical values will come from the t-table with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. 
For very large samples, the t-test and the z-test are actually identical because the critical values for the t-test, when n is very large, become the z-table critical values. This can be seen by looking at the t-table in your textbook, following all the way down the table to the row that's labeled infinity. As you look across the critical values of that row of the table, you should see the actual z critical values. Therefore, for very large samples, the t-test and the z-test are identical. t-tests, however, give us a way to compensate for the uncertainty in the estimation of our parameter sigma when we only have small samples. When we do have small samples, we are estimating sigma with s, and there is some error in that estimation. The t-test critical values allow us to compensate for that error. In practice, t-tests rather than z-tests are used because the mean and standard deviation are estimated from the sample data. To carry out a one-sample t-test, we follow the same procedure as we do for the one-sample z. We state the null and alternative hypothesis. We set the alpha value at either 0 0.01, 0 0.05, or 0 0.10. We compute the value of the test statistic. This time, the t with n minus 1 degrees of freedom is equal to x bar minus mu naught divided by s over the square root of n. We find the critical value from the t table with n minus 1 degrees of freedom, and we compare the test statistic to that critical value to draw a conclusion from the test. Therefore, the only thing that changes from the one sample z to the one sample t is that the critical values now come from the t table. In practice, t tests are used as the default test. Again, the objectives of this PowerPoint presentation were to allow the students to differentiate between a one sample z test and a one sample t test and describe when to use each test. The difference between a one sample z-test and a one sample t-test are when you are estimating the data for a one sample t-test, you use the sample standard deviation and the sample mean. Plugging in the sample standard deviation into the t-test formula requires that you get your critical value from the t-table. By default, in practice, you should use a t-test rather than a z-test because it is almost unheard of where you actually would have the population standard deviation sigma.